So hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Aura Vasquez, and it's a great honor to have you all today here at the live stream at the virtual town hall meetings. This is Aura's BTH. And today I'm joined by somebody very special, very dear to my heart, somebody that I also, we ran for office at the same time, and she made it to the uh, general elections is great. And this is Nitya Raman, who is um, running for city council right now on District 4. So please uh, join me to welcome Nitya to my live stream. Hi, Nitya. Hi. How are you? How is it going? It's going well. So I have two different versions of this. This is an interesting. <laughs> That's why. That's why earlier I was telling you you should just put, oh, do it all. At, do it do, all the cameras at once. It could get confusing. Yeah. So wait, and then I have a question. Are you listening through your headphone or no? I'm listening through the the headset and the uh, and also through the through. The, I can I can hear both. Oh, okay, interesting. But I think I have more volume here. Got it. So yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So bear with us, everyone. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to make this work. Saying hello. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can. Yes, thank you guys. Sorry about this. Trying to make this stand up in a way that some people are saying hi, ladies. I love it. <laughs> okay, cool. All well, right. Welcome. Just get all, get comfortable, settle in wherever you are. Thank you for tuning in. I'm speaking today. My name is Aura Vasquez, and I'm speaking today with Anitia Raman, who is running for city council. Have your questions and your comments ready. This is not the place to hold back. This is the place to literally let it all go. So um, please go on the post in the comments and ask your questions. As her and I uh, have a, a candid conversation about her race, what's like to run, you know, for office, and and a lot more. So how are you doing, Ethia? It's almost show time. It's coming so fast. Election. I know. Well, in some ways it's nearby, and in some ways it's not. Um, a person from my campaign team was reminding me that we are in the previous election. We're still at the time that was before Thanksgiving. Oh, that's right. Uh -huh. You know, right? And that feels early. Yeah. But it also feels late. Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting how the schedule of this works. It's very uh, intense and it's intense for so long. But yeah, it's, it's, it's like nothing else I've ever experienced. We never, you know, running for office, people kind of have an idea of this. They, people have ideas of this house of cards sort of things that happen behind the scenes, you know, um, maybe the glamorous life of a, 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 a candidate, but at least for me, it wasn't very glamorous. It's, you know, I'm an organizer, so it was really the fruit of a lot of love and a lot of ideas and a lot of folks that came, um, you know, to support my campaign. What, are, what has been some of the things that you have really there enjoyed? There you go. <laughs> but what, what have been some of the things that you have really enjoyed about running for for office? No, oops, no, nope, did not. Did not. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <It's> okay. <laughs> this do there's uh, just so everybody who is watching this understands there are two cameras, one off my phone and one off my computer, both of which are on right now. So I'm trying to <laughs> because we're streaming on. Hello, FaceTime. Hello, Twitter. Hello, Twitch. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> Hi YouTubers. Hi, and also Instagram. So we are got everybody covered. And if you don't Great. like Instagram, go jump on my YouTube channel. It's all good over there, too. Okay, cool. Well, so, you know, you were talking about whether it's glamorous or what it's like to be actually running for office. And, you know, I think one of the things that has come into real... Um, let's say relief in the pandemic is how hard it is on people with children. Mm -hmm. you know? And I really wonder how much people are able to do this, even in their normal circumstances who have small families, you know, or small children or, or even older children, but really who have children because running for office, um, I don't know about you, Aura, but I had to leave my job to do this. 
And, yeah. you know, the only reason I was able to do it was because I have a partner, my husband, who is working right now. And so he was able to support me for the duration of the of the race. And that's, you know, I'm very, that's very lucky. I'm very privileged to have that. Um, but I just wonder, you know, how many people are limited from being able to run for office because they don't have that kind of structure. Yeah, and I think you, you're bringing up a really good point, which is for women, and I'm, I'm gonna touch upon women of color in just a second, but for women in general, it's, it's especially harder to run for office. A lot of us are mothers, I'm not a mother, but a lot of women that are mothers that want to run for office, it's really hard because running running for office so the system the machine as some people know it of running for office is not set up for any woman of any color no of any size that's correct that is absolutely right um and you know it's, we live in a world where women are still the primary caregivers for children often um i think a lot of women uh, are also part of something called a sandwich generation right so they're caring for young people and they're caring for older people in their homes so they're doing both. They're doing an extraordinary amount of care work. And the way in which the political system here in Los Angeles has worked for many, many years is that you essentially had to go through, and I didn't even know this, by the way, till I started running. Um, you had to go through and get uh, friends and networks in all of these democratic clubs. Um, you have to attend endorsements. endorsements. You have to go and make build relationships with people so that when you are finally lining up for those endorsement interviews and lining up for those things you have a base of support in those groups now what does that take like i i had a full-time job i was running a um you know a volunteer led nonprofit in my neighborhood which i founded with a bunch of my neighbors um and I also had my two little kids. On top of that, if I had also been going to all of these dem clubs and trying to, you know, build up my support base and get to put myself in a place where I could really get those kinds of endorsements, I just think that that's not realistic. You know, there's no way that I I I I didn't do that and there's no way that I would have done that and it really put me at a disadvantage when I was in those processes applying for endorsements and looking at that thing. Now, ultimately, that didn't end up mattering very much for my race because we made it through to the runoff with a significant percentage of the vote anyway. But this is how politics has worked in L.A. for so long. And it is a system which just in the amount of time that is required makes it very hard for caregivers to be able to participate fully in the process. And, and I just want to add, not just. I mean. I was just uh, today having a conversation with uh, someone that I'm advising about how to run for office. And my first advice was throw all that shit through the window because in reality, who you need to talk to is your voters. Yes. So that's true. micro like laser focus on your voters, which is your community already. So now all of this, all winning the hearts and the minds and the votes of these democratic clubs or, you know, political committees and stuff like that, is a job within itself, as you yes, explain. Exactly. And it's very clicky and it's very tribal. It's very identity politics. It's who you know, how much you like them, how much you have shown around. You can be the worst candidate. You can be the the, the really the, the candidate doesn't stand for anything. But as long as you have this relationship. So again, it reminds me a little bit of my first organizing principle that I learned when I work at Pico, which is the power is in the relationship. So this really comes comes to play, but the same power that you have, you know, also uh, working with your community and in building that, as you said, base, volunteer base, you know, where your community. So yeah, running for office as a woman. Now you are first. I believe you are first generation American. Uh, this is such a silly question. First generation is people it's who were you born, born here. Who, you were born here. No, I am an immigrant. I moved here when I was six. Okay, so you're yeah. like me. We were. Yeah. I, I moved here when I was 18, and I found it extremely difficult because I didn't go to high school here. I didn't have that type of network to call and say, "Hey, can you donate a hundred bucks for my campaign?" Right. Right. It, it was. It was really hard. Can you can you share a little bit of your, how has been your experience? You you were here a little longer than me, but 
How yeah. is your experience as an immigrant running for for city council? I feel like we dare all of all of the, the all, all of the obstacles. I think we we still jump in, but as as immigrants, you know, we're even far behind. You know than others. Yeah, I think that that is right. I mean, I think one of the things that, um, so I'm South Asian, and um, in my upbringing, I wasn't encouraged to necessarily be a politician. Not that I wasn't encouraged to succeed, but this wasn't something that we had focused on in my house. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Political engagement was not a big priority for my um, for my family, my parents. But the other thing that I think is interesting about the South Asian community is that I think only now are they realizing the value of being politically engaged in America in some ways. I mean, there, there has been some, so I don't want to diminish it. But I, there's not a culture of, for example, um, political donations, mm -hmm. you know? So when you go and tell your community, like I grew up in the Boston area. And so when I went and told my Boston community that I was running for office, people were happy, but they didn't immediately understand that donations are the way that you support a candidate, you know? So I think in some ways, um, being an immigrant, um, I think is, um, it, it can be good because you have that community that you are with, you know, that, that, that believes in you. And, you know, we had a very tight community, um, growing up, but I think it's also harder because not every community, um, is equally kind of engaged in the political process. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's so crazy because in, in my district where I've run, um, 60% of, uh, my community uh, here in District Tank are Latinos, but Latinos don't vote at the same rate as African Americans or whites or so. Right, so right. people used to tell me, like, I mean, you're even running at even a more uphill battle because right. you know you you Latinos don't don't um don't vote. And I really hope that with this pandemic, if we can find any silver lining, or just in general, even yeah. seeing Trump in office. Yeah. Even seeing the way that we have treated our homeless community, which I want to talk to you about that, our environment, the way that we treat just our city. I really hope that not just Latinos, but everyone wakes up and, and votes this year. Because yeah. it's, it's that important. Is it true that there's a lower voter participation rate among, among um, Latinos here in L.A.? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. In some areas, they're really organized because they they outnumber greatly the community. But in general, we don't vote at the same rate, and and sometimes we vote more conservatively hmm. than other groups. So, it's, and you know, I'm Colombian. I'm from South America, and there is not a lot of Colombians in in LA either. So that made it all. But you know what? I just got to say that to me it was an incredible experience running for office and meeting my. Neighbor. And understanding better what their needs were and, and just giving people hope. A lot of my voters were first time voters. A lot of my voters were young people. You know, a lot of my voters were grandmothers too, that they were like, oh my God, you Miha, were you the first Latina we ever seen running for office in this district? And we're excited and you're younger. And, you know, so I'm sure you have a lot of stories and maybe you wanna share a few with us about your experiences meeting the community canvassing and such when we when we were able to canvass <laughs> i know gosh i loved canvassing so much yeah um you know i'm trying to think of one particular experience that really stands out with canvassing um one time i remember that i was knocking on doors in a neighborhood which um where most of the residents i would say were um, very nervous about homelessness mm -hmm. They were, uh, you know, it took me, I had a lot of great conversations in this neighborhood, but it took me a long time to kind of get to them, get them to a point where they could see that the kinds of policies that I was proposing on homelessness would actually be beneficial 
for them as well as for people experiencing homelessness, which was the case that I was always making through the campaign, that the system right now is not working for anybody, least of all people who are homeless, but um, you know, for housed residents as well. It's just not working for any of us. So I knocked on a door and it was a very, very frail older woman. And I thought, you know, she would be very nervous about homelessness as well, and maybe would have some fears around walking around in her neighborhood. And I said a few things about my policies and my platform. And she was just like, oh, you have, you had my vote long ago. And, right. you know, and, and I think the, the, to me, the moral of the story was, and I think, cause it's such a, you know, I, I'm running in such a strange district. Okay. I'm running in this district, which is stretching from Silver Lake all the way to Sherman Oaks goes through the Hollywood Hills, goes through Hollywood, um, goes through parts of Koreatown, goes all the way in the Miracle Mile. These are neighborhoods which are really different in terms of their demographic mix, in terms of the kind of incomes that people are earning, in right. terms of the kind of lifestyles that people are living. And I think for me, it just, it just went to show that you can, it's, you know, there's a lot of people who can really surprise you. Um, yeah. And in every neighborhood, I would go into it. And sometimes I would have preconceived notions about how that neighborhood would respond to my uh, my pitch. But, you know, I would say 90% of the time when I knocked on a door and I was able to have a conversation with somebody, they walked away so positive about what the things I was, you know, the things I was saying and what was happening. So it was a really, it was a really exciting experience. And I just want to mention that I think that happens because I think people are really hoping and, and seeing that career politicians have only got us so far. Yeah. I and, think we're in an, and we're in an era where we want people that had the same experience that we had had leading us. Yeah. You know, back in those days, we were used to the white men that were lawyers, you know, business people were the ones running for office. Now we see more nurses, more teachers, more mothers. It's so more nice. More students, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. running more diversity because, I mean, how, how do you go and defend someone out there when you yourself haven't really experienced what's like to stand in the grocery store in a line for an hour to buy your groceries with a face mask on, exposing your life, you know, for, you know, for, for whatever you need? Or, or how is it like? Uh, you know, for you to stand in a in a food bank line because you just need to choose between paying rent or paying for food. Right. And, yeah. and one of the things that you mentioned earlier is that you you know you're a mother of two beautiful kids. You know, I seen or uh, your children, and 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 now having school, this is when we have really seen the the contracts, the effect of our public school system. Now that is great. And now that it, not, it doesn't need fixing and that it's not broken, but just as a, as a place where your kids were going while you were at work or where you were doing other things. So now the homeschooling part, I, I, want, I want you to maybe take us a little bit on, on how that experience has been for you at homeschooling because I have friends that have children and they're like, I can't believe we're not gonna open the schools. Like it's not even, not, now that I don't love my children and I don't, I don't wanna have them, but this is like, I can work, I, you know, it's, yeah. it's a big responsibility for a lot of parents. And I want to talk to later, I want to talk about more about other parents that are even more challenged than maybe us. So how has been your experience homeschooling your children and running for office? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's been, it's been tough. Um, I will say that my children are young enough that I'm not as concerned about them meeting particular learning achievements. Mm -hmm. They're only there. I have four and a half year old twins. And so for me, you know, if they're not absolutely, you know, learning how to read by the end of this year, it's not the end of the world. You know, I think for me, I consider really um, any day where uh, they're not watching TV a lot to be a win. You know, that's, that's it. That's, all, that's as high as my standards go at this point. Um, the first couple of months in the pandemic when we were really advised not to have anyone else at home, uh, when it was just me and my partner, my husband taking care of the kids all day, I still had to move the campaign along. And so each day my husband and I would split time, you know, so he would take half the day with the kids, I would take half the day, and then the rest of the time they would be kind of on screens, either on an app or on a TV or something. 
and it was never enough time. Uh, a few weeks ago, we started having um, uh, the children's longtime babysitter come back home. You know, we agreed about how we would, you know, do our social distancing and uh, how what kind of rules we would have. And now she's in the home uh, a few hours a day. So it's just been an incredible relief. But again, sure. yeah, but it's just been, uh, it, you know, I'm doing as much work as I was during the first part of the campaign. But during the first part of the campaign, during the primary, I was... I had the school, my kids' preschool. My mom was here or my mother-in-law was here uh, almost the entire time during the campaign helping to provide childcare support. Plus we had babysitters, plus I had my husband helping me. Right. And now I have just, you know, just this few hours a day. So it has been incredibly challenging. Uh, you know, I would say that I feel lucky because we have had a babysitter who can come in who has been able to provide that relief and that's been lucky. And I don't think I would have been able to make any progress on my campaign without that, um, yeah. without her presence. But I just, you know, it's the reality of the, of now. And I don't know, you know, I look now at what is happening in terms of educational outcomes. You know, we wrote, we put out a policy about public broadband recently mm -hmm. um, through yeah. the campaign. And I know you wanted to talk about that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And it wasn't, it wasn't so much a, um, you know, we didn't have a strong, kind of, um, for a lot of things, we've come at it with a very clear perspective on what are the most important next steps. What we wanted to do with this was really to explore an issue here in LA, okay. which is to look at the differences between um, access to uh, internet, access to broadband mm -hmm. uh, across Los Angeles and look at the kind of diversity of outcomes that has emerged or the the kind of the truths about inequality that have been unearthed as a result of the pandemic, which I think is not just true in terms of access to internet, but it is, it's there across every single issue that we care about in Los Angeles, right? And so here, what has happened is that you see that there are huge parts of Los Angeles where people are uh, have only one broadband provider, that broadband provider is charging, um, higher level, uh, you know, a higher price for lower levels of quality. Right. There are numerous households who lack either a computer or a tablet or lack the level of internet speed that they need in order to attend virtual classrooms, yeah. right? And that this, if you look at a map of Los Angeles, these, these kind of gaps in access to internet map exactly with communities of color, and with lower income communities low across, income. Yeah, across the city. Unsurprising, right? As with everything else that we've seen in terms of COVID related outcomes, um, it's, it's incredibly kind of segregated by class and by, by race. Absolutely. And, yeah, and so the, the policy was looking at, okay, well, what can the city do to actually change this, to challenge this? And one thing that other cities have done is to invest in a public fiber network, right? to invest in incredibly fast broadband, because actually in Los Angeles, we have some of the slowest broadband speeds across the country. Wow. Not, not just not for everybody, not just for uh, particular families or particular neighborhoods, but in the city as a whole. And we pay more for worse, um, we pay more for worse internet here than in other cities. And so we were talking about a city, Chattanooga, Tennessee, that has invested in a public fiber network that has managed to make profits off of that network um, and has actually managed to um, uh, provide incredibly fast speeds of internet for uh, all of its residents. So I think that there are things that we can do here. It's in, it's very expensive. This is no joke yeah. for the city to take on. It can cost, you know, I think estimates right now peg public broad uh, or putting down fiber lines at $3 billion. You know, so it's a huge- but You know, we give, we give a bunch of billion to the police. Yeah, so maybe we can take one of those billions and do it <laughs> and invest it, on, invest it on this thing. I I just want to interject a little bit on what you're saying because as a as a as a Latina as a as an Afro Latina and as someone that spoke to so many low income Latinos in my district, it's been really heartbreaking to watch. Yeah, um, you know that a lot of the families couldn't stay home, their kids had to stay home because of, you know, school is closed. 
and they didn't have computers and they didn't have internet and they also didn't have anybody in the household that could help you know even uh breach right the technological difficulties and 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 i mean and also meals i mean there is so many and if you if you fast forward all of those things to let's say a decade later or maybe two decades later where these children are going to be working i mean let's talk about why people make low wages because who's going to be able to go to a, a a good school or or just go to a, 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 a go to college and continue your education if you are set up to not succeed from the get go yeah. you know and somebody somebody said this very well said said COVID has really exposed our inequalities. I don't think we can turn away our heads away. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I, that's the, as you said, you know, you don't want to talk about any silver lining. This is such a terrible moment um, that you never want to talk about anything really good coming from this. But, um, but I do, I do hope that, you know, whenever we get through this moment, that we look back at what was exposed through this and decide that this this was unacceptable, then that this is unacceptable for us as a society, you know? Healthcare, um, I mean, so many things, healthcare, so education. Things. I mean, look at how, look who got the money from, uh, you know, who got the stimulus money. It wasn't those families. Right. Because a lot of them are undocumented also right. and they right. can't really apply for any support it's right. been really heartbreaking yes absolutely um i'm curious too about kind of um out of your experience after your election can i ask about that yeah well you know i i i have been organizing for so long and before i ran for office i I work with the National Democratic Training Committee, so I work for the DNC, and I went all around the country training people on how to run for office. So organizing for me wasn't anything that uh, I was gonna. It was I was I'm done with the campaign, so I'm done, you know, helping my community. It it was not that way. So you know, we founded. I founded a, a mutual aid called Ready to Help, mm -hmm. and is. Is we've been supporting with food vouchers to our community. Uh, at, at first, is just checking in with folks about how you know how what support they need and and understanding that we're gonna need we're gonna need to be bundled up with our tribe with like immediate tribe and uh, you know in terms of geography and location. And then just recently, I decided well you know something that has been really speaking to me for a really long time is. How do I also help other people shine, transform, you know, and 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 go out there and go get the world and and be great? So I founded the Janus Academy, and I've been just teaching folks skills on organizing, storytelling, social media, so that wow. they can be the best they can be. Because really, if anything, that is the pandemic exposed for me that this is a moment of radical gifting. Mm -hmm. radical giving and i really hope that our elected officials get to that place this is not a place to hold back this is the place this is the moment to give all you got yeah and i'm a firm believer that all that stuff are gonna come back to you so i lost my job in the pandemic and i'm sure something is gonna turn up so but i'm, I'm just really invested and really excited and i have a bunch of students now and it's it's really it's awesome it's great that's great. And you've been doing these virtual town halls regularly. You're really engaging with the public in a, such an intense way. I love the model of post uh, campaign life that you're living, which is that you'd never stop being a public um, teacher and figure and somebody who servant. is yeah. Yeah, a public servant, you know, and I think that whatever the outcome of that election was, you know, you, you continue to do that, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, you know, like I said, I, or community organizing, I organize my family, I, or <laughs> I organize my friends, I organize, yeah. you know, I use the model of community organizing on everything I do. So it was no brainer. And, and my hope is that we can go to see some people laughing with me. And, and I, and I, you know, this is also a moment where we need to really have a lot of self love. 
I personally yeah. believe that this is the moment to be gentle, to check on your friends, check on your families and to, yeah. to lean on your community. Yeah. So I also try to inspire people to say, hey, you can be who you are and also be a candidate, you know, and, and also you can be a mom and you can be a candidate. Yeah. I had a question for you, um, which is what do you, how do you think the change in the timeline of the elections going from being their own elections to being aligned with the federal elections. Um, how do you think that impacted your race and how do you think that it, you know, um, did it make it easier for non, for kind of insurgent candidates, for grassroots candidates to run or did it strengthen traditional candidates? Cause I think I've heard two different kinds of opinions about this. Yeah. And I'm so curious about what your experience was with it and kind of what you would recommend to people who are trying to really improve and deepen democracy in Los Angeles. Yeah, so I, I believe for me, it helped my race because more people, there was a, a little bit of a larger turnout, but I think because I was the first one, you know, that I was the first, the first race to kind of fall into everything. I think in the future, we, what I would like to see is more of the, support to the down ballot candidates to the local candidates we put so much emphasis on the national so yeah. a lot of my voters were bernie sanders supporters for example and they were busy supporting bernie sanders so they right. maybe didn't volunteer for me and such so and my hope is that at some point we all align from national to local yeah. and that the emphasis is that people can exercise the right to vote because there was a real shit show and election day in Los Angeles where people yes. spent two hours trying to get to cast their vote. And where a lot of people, instead of utilizing the new machines and everything that they were using, they have to write it down and, you know, insert it. So I think that, I think that as, as we kind of work those things out and, and, and let's just face it, we need a democratic party that is of the 2020 year. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and we see that so that what's happening at the local level is just a reflection of what's happening at the national level and, and, and the other way around. Yeah. So we, we continue supporting these corporate Democrats. We continue supporting Democrats that are kind of halfway there. Yeah. And, and this is not the time for that. I mean, look, life is giving us such a crazy opportunity with COVID-19 because it's been something that we cannot turn our heads away. It's our lives or money. Yeah. And, and it doesn't, and to me, it's always going to be about life. But how do we turn this opportunity into something that can better our communities and, and bring us to the next level of almost awakening you know, in politics and and in society so that we can be better. I mean, the fact that we're still discussing whether people can need to wear a mask or not. Yeah. It's sad. Yeah. Really sad. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that if I if I could if I could uh do it all over again or if I had the opportunity to be more involved in how the voting process works. Yeah, I would probably have invested way more in on on getting people out to vote. And I love that right now. Everybody's going to get a, a ballot in the mail. Right. So yeah. I don't want to hear any excuses. If you're all watching, you got to tell your cousins, your friends, your parents, your ex-boyfriends. Everybody needs yeah. to vote. There's no excuses yeah. anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a question here for you. Okay. Um, and let me see if I can bring it in. So they're asking, how did your background in urban planning lead you and how does it relate to running for city council? Oh, how does it lead me? That's what is it lead you, I guess, to run for office. Oh, 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 got it. You know, um, I've talked about this a lot on the campaign trail, but, uh, you know, I never thought I would be running for office and always thought I would be kind of in the nonprofit space or working in government, maybe. But I was a volunteer in my own neighborhood uh, on homelessness. I kept having to interact with the city 
over and over again as we tried to get more services for people experiencing homelessness. Uh -huh. And the more I worked with the city, the more I realized that the people in power were actually standing in the way of better policies locally. That people in power were kind of slow walking changes that could really transform how we respond to homelessness because they had very narrow um, ideas of what their role was and who they wanted to respond to. They really prioritize certain kinds of needs locally and certain kinds of constituents and didn't prioritize others. And there I'm really looking at people who didn't have housing in their own neighborhood. Hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, I kept hitting up against the city as a, as a barrier. And I knew because of my background in urban planning as somebody who had spent a lot of time thinking about cities, as someone who knew how powerful LA City Council is, it's so powerful here. I you know that's why you ran out of because of the opportunity for change. That's yeah. why I'm running. It's because of the opportunity for incredible change, not just on homelessness, on housing, on environment, on all of the issues that we care about so much. The city can do so much, but they do so little. Yeah. And so I think it was my, you know, it was my work, it was my urban urban work, work on urban poverty related issues that led to my increasing levels of frustration. And then my understanding of how we needed to make change, which was really informed by my training as an urban planner, you know, because I knew that unless we were able to change the levers of power here in Los Angeles, that at the city level, Mm -hmm. that we wouldn't be able to achieve the outcomes that we wanted to on any of the issues that we cared about. You know, yeah, it, just, it just felt like an incredibly effective way of getting, getting things done. Yeah. And for, and for some folks that are joining and maybe don't know city councils and city council members in Los Angeles hold more power than a lot of Congress members in yes. other states. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And they manage a larger budget than some of the you know estates out there. So this is this is why it's so hard and this is why the power is so entrenched. Yep. Um so I guess I want to ask you right now you're in the in the um you are in you are in the general you headed to the general how I'm is in the it <laughs> oh, yeah you're you're in the general now how is it looking with your opponent? What are some of the contrasting differences between you two? Um, so I think, you know, I was looking um, at the last race that he ran in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the difference between us is really clear in you, if you look at the kinds of campaigns we ran um, in, in our races. So in the previous election, very, very few people voted. It was a low turnout race, uh, just, you know, did wasn't aligned with the, with the general election. And during that race, the key issues that were discussed were really issues that were important to, um, to homeowners, uh, to single family homeowners, to people who had a particular vision of priorities for the city. Those are important priorities, I agree with, the, the, the fact that roads need to be fixed and that neighborhoods need to be clean and all of that stuff. My campaign was really built around the idea that there were crises facing mm -hmm. Los Angeles, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. our city didn't just have a responsibility to pick up our garbage on time and to make sure our roads were repaired, but that our city had a responsibility to make sure that every resident, particularly those with access to fewer resources, had the ability to thrive and yeah. we put those issues at the center of our campaign from day one. Um, and I think that's really the biggest difference between us. The second thing that I will say um, that I'm very proud of is that we've never just, uh, it's never been just about me or my background or who I am uh, in running for the seat. It's always been about policies. Mm -hmm. It's always been about what are the ways in which I would change how things are being done here, how would I change, how investments are being made in the city in terms of what they're investing in, in terms of services, in terms of infrastructure, to get to the outcomes that we need to go to. And so in the primary and something we've continued through the general is that we have released some of the most detailed policy platforms of any city council candidate actually across the city. Um, and our focus on policy has really brought people into the race, people who care about issues, 
are excited to take part in someone who also feels passionately about those issues and about those policy outcomes. And so through that, the third difference comes out, which is that we've really managed to galvanize interest in a local race from volunteers, which is very unusual for Los Angeles. Yeah. You know, it's a challenge, as you said. Um, we had hundreds of volunteers come and knock on doors in the primary, and we've already had hundreds of volunteers sign up for the general to do text banking, phone banking, postcarding. We can't knock on doors right now. But we're continuing to basically bring people power to the forefront um, in Los Angeles. Uh, and we're doing it through a campaign that has not taken a single dollar from a corporation. We haven't taken any money from the real estate industry. We haven't taken any money from the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't taken any money from police unions. You know, we're doing it through a campaign that is free of uh, vested interests and people who seek to profit off of the city. We're really trying to build a campaign of the people. And people are really responding to that, I'm very happy yeah. to say. That is so exciting. I wanna thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that this is not the last time that you join. I mean, I would love to come back. <laughs> Next time I'll make sure that I have the setup better. I didn't quite <laughs> understand what I was getting into. For sure, for sure. And, and I know that there is so much more that we can talk to. So I would love to have you back. And uh, how can people find you if they want to volunteer for you, if they want to support you? How can they do that? So uh, you can go to my website, nithyaforthecity.com. It's N-I-T-H-Y-A. Uh, for the city. Uh, and you can sign up to volunteer there. You can also follow us on Instagram or on Twitter. We're very active on socials uh, and on Facebook, Nithya for the city on Instagram and Facebook and Nithya V. Raman on Twitter. Beautiful. Well, yeah. thank you so much. You have a wonderful day. You, I guess, you. I don't know what to say. See you in the campaign trail or in the virtual campaign virtual trail. Virtual campaign trail, exactly. <laughs> and we'll have you back. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank thank you. you, Laura. Of course, thank you to everyone that participated today. It's been uh, wonderful to have you and have all your comments. Again, this, uh, I do these conversations to just attract uh, a good dialogue and such. So if you like what you saw, Please share with some friends, uh, share with your networks, leave a comment, and the conversation always continues online, so you can join me there, and have a lovely and amazing afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Bye.